Welcome back to the Battle of Blenheim, 13th of August, 1704. I'm still playing this game. Um, we are starting turn three. Well, we've actually just played the first half of turn three. The, the Anglo allies just took their uh, turn three half of the turn. Um, if you are coming to this video new, I highly recommend, uh, and you don't know about this game, I highly recommend you check out the first video I did here, which was kind of an introduction, uh, a work through the rules over a couple turns, uh, overview of what the game's all about, and some of the really novel concepts that are uh, at, at work here. Um, so I'm just going to jump right ahead into uh, gameplay, and uh, if you want to know what's going on, you should check that video out. So the Anglo Allies. So one of the things I'm learning about this game is that the action economy is so tight. You're not going to be doing more than you know two or three things per turn just based on the way that the orders die rolls work out. The Anglo Allies actually got a really good uh, run. They got five orders last turn. That's quite a lot. Uh, they had some good dice. Um, even still, with five orders, I still wasn't able to... Um, <laughs> do everything that I wanted to do. It's it's such a tight action economy. Um, so I left some of the markers here to show you what went on. We did two assaults against the town of Blenheim itself, one from here and one from here. This one failed, but this one succeeded. And when you attack an area more than once in a turn, you get some bonuses. So that's what allowed me to do that. Most of my battalion guns were in here. You can see there's only one unit left in there. One of the other units had to withdraw. We've got some beat up disorganized Anglo allies you here. That's why Marlboro moved down. He's going to rally them at the end of this turn. There's also some interesting implications about uh, commander movement. So commander uh, leaders rally units only. And uh, they are not. there's a one turn delay behind it. So you always, the last thing you do on a turn is move your leaders. And rally comes after your orders phase on the next turn. So you've got to wait. There's a, a long lag time in getting your or units reorganized. So you better have um, good positioning to allow for the maneuver of fresh units to the front. We did okay there. I'm learning uh, how to do it better as we go. Uh, but here's our main attack force. And uh, they don't have any battalion guns, but the softening up of that first uh, attack on the town uh, did disorganize one of these French units. That's going to be problematic for them this turn. It's possible those units route if the French don't move them out of there. Uh, but if the French move them out of there, then they're extremely exposed. So we're thinking about a counterattack, maybe. Oh, this guy's demoralized as well. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. These guys, because they're not in the center and they're on the edge, they can't attack. So they're in a... Uh, they're in a uh, defensive posture and it's really like you would think like oh god these guys are right here on the edge of my area they're gonna be able to counterattack me that's actually not the case you have the most dangerous stacks are the ones that are in the middle of, of the areas and so um that would take a, a lot of orders to be able to get them to be able to attack one to move them to the center another one to then attack and that's probably the only thing the french would be doing on the turn although that may be worth it so who knows um, so anyways, at the end of the attack phase, we remove these markers. It's just a reminder to show you what, uh, what orders you've carried out. Um, the French chose not to withdraw from Blenheim. There's some really good, uh, bonuses on defense, uh, in the town. So they're just going to gut it out. The French do have a reserve down here that they can try and bring up. Uh, but Talar is not able to move them, uh, this turn. So again, the delay, you know, had we known that this attack was going to be successful, maybe Talar would have moved down here last turn to try and get these guys, uh, ready to go. But I think right now he's just going to try and rally some of these French units on this turn. That's why I think I moved him there. Um, French artillery continues to be pretty deadly, uh, d disordering, um, Anglo allied units, um, kind of across the board have really stymied Eugen's attack here on the, uh, the left, the French left. Um, we were getting ready to assault from these hills artillery. This artillery has moved and is now, it has fired here. Um, so we're really, uh, open, uh, and ripe here for, um, to be exploited. Eugen's trying to rally, some of these units back to good order. His cavalry still waiting in the rear, um, <laughs> trying to figure out what I'm going to do with them. There is an opportunity potentially to come down here with the cavalry if I can get them down here next turn and do a cavalry charge here or possibly here. Um, that might uh, throw some disarray, probably here because Oberglauheim is going to be defensive. That'll throw some disarray into the French center and uh, make Marsan have to figure out what he's going to do. But the French are pretty happy right now to just sit fire their guns, force the Anglo allies to come to them. We've really got to catch up the rest of Marlborough's army um, to, or put them at least somewhere where they can make a difference. Attacking across these river, this river is not a good idea. Don't want to be doing that. Maybe we move them in here or in, in, in here possibly to put some pressure on Oberglauheim. That might be uh, something we can do. But again, once we move Marlborough over here to do that in the strategic movement phase, we take away his influence uh, in this area of the map. So we want to get set here first. Um, before we start doing that. There's just, again, the action economy is so tight. Um, you really got to focus the battlefield on what you're trying to do um, in specific areas. So uh, the French are going to go, and uh, this is turn three, so we're an hour into the battle. I think the Anglo allies have made some pretty good progress here on the flank near Blenheim, 
and uh, we're going to try and continue that. Turn four, starting, casualties building up. We did have a, a French unit route, the, the uh, disrupted unit in Blenheim actually routed, uh, given the <laughs> partial encirclement the uh, Anglo allies have made of the town. That's going to be very problematic uh, for the defense, given that the Anglo allies are going, going next. Um, yeah, uh, so some, some good progress being made down here in the village. Uh, elsewhere along the line, the French decided to launch a counterattack with a cavalry charge. That charge was extremely effective. Uh, it actually destroyed uh, an Anglo Allied unit, so we're up to two apiece, and actually forced this one really far back into these marshes. So a little bit exposed here to artillery, but if we can avoid taking... I wanted to get the elimination was why I did that charge and it was to open a hole here as well to make the Anglo allies think twice about where they're going to put Oigan's cavalry. I suspect this unit is going to become disrupted by this artillery next turn, although it may not. And if it doesn't, then the French can charge the artillery, which would be a huge coup for them. Um, we're, and then over here on the left, the French also made another counterattack here against these, uh, against the Anglo allied units that were here on the right in these, in this sort of high woods. Um, they came up, they made an attack actually, eliminated, uh, I believe, one of these units, forced the other one back, disrupted. He's going to be out of the fight probably for a little while. And uh, they didn't take any hits themselves. So they really secured that left flank um, around Lutzingen uh, because it's going to be very hard now for the uh, Austrians to bring a lot of combat power to bear against uh, the, the village. The French are just really locking it down over here. I think if we're going to somehow you know, make some progress here, f sort of challenge the, the French left, it's going to have to be these cavalry coming down into this, uh, into de Marsan's um, wing of the army, because I don't see a way to recover from what the French have been able to do there. So it's really all on the, uh, all on uh, Marlborough and all on the center um, to, to make some hay. Alrighty. The Duke has taken Blenheim from the French uh, he actually wasn't personally involved in the attack. He, he moved down here uh, just recently on the end of the, the British turn because he wanted to be able to order um, some of these units. But Blenheim is in British hands, uh, British allied hands. Uh, the French uh, recuperating. They did make a counterattack in here, um, disorganizing here. They, they sort of to the northwest of the town. Um, they were able to rally and, and make a counterattack, force back the uh, brigade here. So it's uh, not a sure thing that they're going to be able to hold on to it, but it's going to be very difficult to uh, crack this um, without any sort of leadership abilities. You do see Marshal Talar here. He's, he did, uh, he's going to, next turn, bring back uh, these two units, but there's going to be a delay. Um, and these units here are probably going to want to uh, not be in defensive formation. They're probably going to want to get back into the center of this area so they can launch an attack potentially. It's a little bit fluid down here, more fluid than you would expect, uh, or than anywhere else on the on the field. Uh, Marlboro does need to get these units moving. They're just kind of wasting space if they're not doing anything here. French have moved up to take a more defensive position into some of these terrain hexes. Uh, and as we go across the line, no one's really threatening Oberglauheim. And then on the left, the uh, Maximilian II has really uh, undone Prince Eugen's uh, offensive. Um, although these units here are pretty good. They both have Italian guns and, uh, those, those French units don't. So we need to try and restore our position on this hill if we can against the Bavarians, um, or at least bring down some of this cavalry to come down through this, um, this terrain down here. There's a lone cavalry unit here. We might try and pick off that's under Mar uh, Marsin. If we can just kind of drive a wedge in here, potentially we can threaten one of these towns, but we're already a third of the way through the game, and it's really hard to get units moving over vast distances unless, uh, with the number of leaders present. Turn five, done. And uh, as we look at sort of the uh, Anglo-Allied advance against the French here on this flank around Blenheim, you can see the front starting to curve in, so you can see some movement here in the, the battle lines drawn up uh, by the maneuvering of uh, Marlborough's troops. <clears throat> We've uh, put our infantry into a defensive position in Blenheim, anticipating a French counterattack. Um, and we've also got some cavalry up here guarding the, the north of the town. We moved down these uh, infantry units here um, just to kind of make sure that the town couldn't be encircled by Talar. And uh, we're in the process of moving more units down. Uh, this turn, the Duke of Marlborough is up here. He's going to sort of reorganize some of these units. What we really need to do is get another axis of attack going. It's going to be difficult and we can't do it here because of the blocking terrain and the stacking limits in these two. 
and we don't want to attack across this river. So, I mean, one of the best places to do it might be, well, we can't do it there because of the blocking terrain. So yeah, it's, a, it's really tough in here, and that's why you're not seeing much action in the center of the map. It's mostly on the flanks. Um, <clears throat> elsewhere, on the front, the French uh, impenetrable here on the left. In fact, we, we did make an attack two to one against that unit, but uh, it was a uh, failed attack. No hits exchanged there. And um, I am now going to roll up the French attrition, possibly, and move their leaders. And then we'll get on to the 2.10 p.m. turn. Turn 6, uh, the 2.10 p.m. turn, actually finally saw some engagement along the center around Oberglauheim. We had kind of this running battle. Uh, it was originally from this area attacking to this area where the French were here. Um, there were no hits done. It should have been a devastating attack, honestly. Um, just a couple of uh, Prince Eugen's cavalry, uh, Austrian cavalry, against uh, Marsan's infantry. Um, and it should have been uh, a pretty devastating attack. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the dice did not go in the French's favor. And uh, we there were no hits done um, either way. It was kind of an inconclusive skirmish. And then given the position that Wagen's cavalry was in, where they were surrounded on three sides by French, they decided to withdraw back to this area here. And then with the next order the French got, they advanced with their... Uh, with the attackers. So it was a bloodless, bloodless taking of ground, which the system does allow to have happen. Um, and both sides didn't get very many orders that turn. Uh, it was a, a pretty lull uh, kind of turn. All the action focused here in the center for both sides jockeying for position. We did have a cavalry charge um, here. Again, Prince Eugen's cavalry trying to get into the game. You can see that it did not go well for them. The, uh, the French counter charged and uh, it was a uh, pretty pretty devastating. Um, so Eugen's there to try and rally them this turn. And then we had over here on this end, we had an attack by the Duke of Marlborough. Again, there was a cavalry charge uh, into this into this hex here. That was a lot more um, successful. We ended up disrupting uh, both French units with this cavalry charge. And we didn't win by enough not to disrupt our own cavalry, but um, we did force the cavalry, the French cavalry that was there to rout at the end of the turn. So uh, we're slowly grinding down the French along the center section. And what my, I guess, goal is, as we're sort of approaching the halfway point of the game, is to just get some units into position to threaten Oberglauheim um, so that the French can't concentrate their defenses um, or at least have to think about using their orders on something other than attacking the, um, the Austrian right flank here. So, so far, so good. Um, you know, uh, the, the unit destruction is now three... Three for the uh, Anglo allies uh, on the French, four on the Anglo allies by the French. So it's still pretty tight, um, and we are seeing some movement uh, in the battle. Um, we've only been, you know, one of the things I was thinking was like, wow, there's not a lot of activity every turn. Each side usually gets between two and three orders, and it doesn't feel like you're able to do a lot. But then I look at the, the game scale, and it's 20 minutes per turn. So if you think about anything that can happen within a 20-minute period, it does actually feel pretty correct in terms of like the activity in 20 minutes. Um is not going to be very much. Uh, and coming from playing a bunch of games that have a one hour turn scale where a lot happens, um, this definitely is much more piecemeal. You can see the battle at sort of a, a level of temporal fidelity um, where not everything is happening in unison. You're really having to, you're seeing different um, moments of action and combat across different parts of the line kind of staggered, which I think is probably more um, reflective of like re reality in terms of looking at something from a real time perspective, like if you were there watching this battle. Um, so that's kind of cool. I just, I'm really impressed with the modeling here, um, given the weird ass systems that are on display. Just had a massive cavalry charge here, uh, with Prince Eugen, it's Austrians. Um, and it was extremely deadly. Uh, the Austrians were thrown back at every attempt. Um, they did disorder a few of the French units, but none of the Austrian units, uh, as part of these cavalry charges were able to, um, remain un uh, disrupted, and I'm very, very concerned now all of a sudden because there are undisrupted French units in both of these areas, and that could cause a general rout amongst these units. Um, so very historical with the uh, cavalry charge up the center that was sort of repulsed by the French, although eventually there was a breakthrough. I'm very, very concerned that we're going to have a, a general cascading rout uh, from all of these units at the end of the turn, so we'll see what happens. But if that occurs, then we might be in real trouble as the Anglo allies. All right, so we did lose a cavalry unit in there who did rout, but the rest of uh, the rest of Eugen's cavalry managed to hold on and stick around uh, for the next turn. 
Uh, down here on the French turn, they conducted a counterattack, actually. They attacked, drove off the uh, Anglo allies here southeast of Blenheim. They made it another attack into Blenheim, where they did disorder one of the units in there um, at the cost of their own disorder. They were trying to get one more order to then attack from here, but unfortunately they didn't roll well enough. So the, the Anglo allies are safe for at least one more turn in there. Um, but suddenly the momentum has shifted against Marlborough and Eugen. Um, pretty drastically. A lot of failed attacks have left them very exposed and wide open. It is not looking very good <laughs> for the Anglo Allies. 75% uh, of the way there for the French. Uh, just so many losses. Uh, and this French counterattack basically forced the Anglo Allies to have a turn where they did nothing but reorganize the, the front around Blenheim just to try and hold the town. Again, victory conditions there. I did realize in the rules I have been forgetting to do cavalry pursuit. So the rule there is if there's a cavalry unit that advances after combat and there's a disrupted unit that is retreating, then you do a hit to that unit. I don't think there's been any combat where that's happened. I may have missed one or two, so the losses might not be perfectly accurate, but that rule is kind of buried in the combat procedure and I've forgotten about it. The one thing I will say, and I'll get into more of this in my uh, final thoughts on the game, but uh, the player aids, uh, while great that they have all the charts, are missing some key things that I think could have been put on here. And uh, especially there's space here and there's space down here as well. So, um, you know, maybe if the logo is a little smaller, we would have had even more space. Um, but I'll tell you what I think should be on there that's missing and things, you know, maybe there's a player uh, created player that's got some of this stuff on it on BGG. I haven't checked, but I it would be worth making one. Um, we are headed into turn nine and uh, the Anglo allies are kind of running out of steam. Um, we do, we have a more refreshed sort of center here. The French have fallen back out of the marshes, so we're going to get a chance to advance on this turn. I think at least this this stack is going to get a chance to advance. Um, and we're just trying to hang on and find areas where we can put some pressure on. It's been just very frustrating. Uh, some just poor rolling on the Anglo allies uh, part to find a, a place where they can, you know, seize the initiative. Just had a super bloody combat uh, where the Anglo allies found their moxie. You had these two infantry brigades come across this river to attack this uh, French cavalry and infantry. Disrupted both of them. Unfortunately, they did two hits back, so everyone's disrupted out of this combat. Unfortunately for the French, and this is the silver lining for the British, they, because... Uh, the difference in hits was f total hits or total value was four. These French units have to retreat. They have to retreat either here or here or here, basically away from the attack. The only way play they, place they can go is there. And then they have to retreat a second hex, um, which has to be either here or here. Um, and unfortunately, both of those hexes are currently stacked in a way that does not let the stack uh, retreat. So we have just eliminated two French units in one fell swoop. And uh, that's a huge coup. For the uh, Anglo allies, they really needed that. Um, that loosens up some of the center. Um, unfortunately, we can't we can't advance because none of our units uh, none of our units uh, were, remained undisrupted. However, there's no danger these are going to route because we're adjacent to so many friendly units and there's no one next to us, so we won't have to check them for route. There's no enemies next to us. So a, a great attack there from the British. 3.30 p.m., we are witnessing the Prince Eugen's forces' uh, right flank just disintegration um, under French attack couple more French assaults. They got into position last turn and they executed this turn. We had a attack into here. Two brigades uh, ended up falling away um, and cavalry pursuit eliminated one of them and actually managed to get all the way across the uh, Nebelbach, which is very dangerous because now these guys are in danger of routing and uh, they only the, the Anglo allies can only afford to lose two more units before the game is over because uh, we've we've kind of stalled out on the attack. Um, we did defend against another French assault on Blenheim. We're doing pretty good down there. There's just, we just don't have the forces that we need and the terrain is really restrictive uh, to be able to put some pressure on Oberglauheim. I'm hoping that this turn we can maybe make like a Hail Mary um, assault there to prevent uh, the defeat, but it's not looking good for Marlboro. Um, the French just too powerful over here and they've been rolling really well all game. The, the Anglo allies have had some really bad dice luck at key moments and the French have just been on fire. Been very feast or famine. <laughs> so, and also the, the Anglo allied artillery hasn't been hitting very much either, which is uh, obviously going to be problematic in any engagement. So we're going to start turn 10 and this may be the final turn. And speak of the devil, we don't even need to play the turn fully all the way through. I don't believe sudden death victory conditions been achieved. French artillery just pounding the line again this turn. Got some really good rolls and eliminated a few 
eliminated uh, the disrupted units here. They did a disruption hit uh, somewhere over here, I believe. So that's 12 units down, and I believe that is a victory for the French and Marshal Talar before the Anglo allies could even make an attack. Um, we'll double check that. Victory conditions. The game is won by the side, which first eliminates 12 enemy infantry and our cavalry units. It occupies two of the victory villages. Uh, yeah, victory is awarded at the end of the turn that these conditions have been met. Okay, so we do have to play through this turn, but uh, it's not looking good. Well, it was a, too little, too late. Prince Eugen personally leading a cavalry charge of the remaining uh, brigades, or I guess they would be regiments or squadrons of his cavalry, and managed to eliminate two more French uh, cavalry units there, which was uh, would have been historical, <laughs> Um Sort of. Uh, his charge was repulsed, uh, or I think the first charge that Eugen did with his cavalry was repulsed at the battle. Um, and then we tried again to charge here, but uh, it was an inconclusive battle. The infantry managed to hold on and stand off, and you can't attack more than twice, so um, that was it. We didn't get any more orders, and uh, Oberglauheim, we couldn't take it. <clears throat> and, of course, Eugen's right flank absolutely decimated by Bavarian troops. Really, the only success was Marlborough around Blenheim, but at the end of the turn... Uh, it's going to be, I, I didn't bother to play the French half of the turn, there's no reason to, uh, because uh, all that will happen will be more casualties, and the French are not going to lose Oberglauheim or Lutzingen here and here. So it's a, a historical French victory, and I have learned a lot about playing this game. Here's the final casualty spread. Marsin's uh, wing ended up taking the most hits, uh, but uh, Talar wasn't far behind, and then obviously you can see the disparity of casualties here with the uh, Austrians against versus what Marlborough took. So thought we thought we could win this one as the Anglo allies, but uh, Marlborough's legend was not to be, at least not today. Um, and so this was an uh, uh, interesting, fun uh, exercise in a brand new system. Uh, I'm going to collect my thoughts on this, and I want to give you them. I have a lot of thoughts about this, and so uh, I really want to make sure I do it justice in terms of my impressions. Okay, the Battle of Blenheim, 13th of August, 1704, designed by Steve Pohl, published by Legion War Games. Um, this was, this is, I guess, top line, um, one of the most unique games, uh, war games that I've ever played. Um, it is so far outside the normal conventions of, uh, war games, specifically tactical, um, tactical battle games, uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, I'm surprised this game has not gotten more buzz, just purely for the fact that it's so original. Um, it feels like the designer, and, and actually this is kind of true, it feels like the designer didn't have any knowledge of existing war game concepts and just created something out of whole cloth that didn't have to hew towards what had come before. And uh, as I guess as a system design that started uh, what, 40 years ago or something like that, uh, it does seem like that. Um, but what I'm really impressed with is actually how playable and fun it is once you get those core concepts down. Um, I think what it's doing <laughs> is so, un so unique and expressive in a way that I would not have expected. If it, had I just read the rule book and not seen how it works in practice, I would have been like, this seems really weird. This seems very abstract and whatnot. Um, and I think the key here is the abstractions. So I talk about this sometimes, um, especially as a game designer, I'm more acutely aware of sort of abstractions and how valuable or harmful they can be to a design. Um, but in this game, the abstractions go such a long way into expressing the history and the tactics and the understanding that I have of uh, Age of Enlightenment warfare. Um, so, like, interestingly. Um, now, I think, I, I will say this up front before I get into some of the specifics. I think that um, if you have trouble with abstractions, like if you need a literal representation or a close to literal representation on your table of what you view in your head as 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 tactical warfare, you may not be able to get into this game. Um, the abstractions here are pretty immense, but I think are very flavorful. Um, but if you can't get over, so for example, I'll give you an example. The areas, right? So you've got all these areas. And if you really look at the map, what we're really talking about here is these areas are basically hexes. And within the hexes, you can take up different positions. And so I love the fact that, like, if I took a unit uh, and I, you know, here, let's take this deck here. If I took a unit, eh, there's there's Marsa, and I said, hey, well, these guys are demoralized, but it's not a great example. But let's say I, I said, hey, you, I want you to, to defend in formation, you know, this hex from these directions. 
Like that is linear warfare, right? Like you can imagine the, the, the brigades lined up in, you know, facing that way and facing that way in sort of like an L formation. And you can see how the, the formation would look um, where you're using something like blocks or looking at a period map. For those of you who have trouble envisioning that, you're probably going to have trouble with this game. You know, it looks like there's a bunch of space between the units. It looks like there's like this whole field between the units. And while it is true, there is space between the units. They're not lined up elbow to elbow. It actually, what this is representing are two hexes. So imagine you had two units and two hexes lined up next to each other, right? Let's do this properly. You know, you, you, normal war games, you expect to see something like that when you have a line of units with, you know, it's a visual representation of your mind's eye. This game does not do that. It doesn't care what's in your mind's eye. It says these are two hexes. These are the units and how they're arrayed inside that hex for whatever they're going to do. Now, if that bothers you, because there's so much space between the units and you you sort of feel like you're just maneuvering little, little blobs around the map, then the abstractions in the rest of the game are really going to bother you. Um, to me, it doesn't bother me. To me, I think it's a really interesting expression of, uh, of a lot of fiddly details in other games around maneuver and facing and all of those things that require man constant manipulation of the counters, constant checking of flanks and all of that stuff, and distills all that down into uh, something that is way more streamlined, that still has those details, but you just have to do, you have to be able to see it in your head. So that's the first thing I'll say. I think the abstractions work really well for me. I love the idea that like, you know, depending on the position of your units, um, you know, if they're in the center of the area, they're ready for maneuver or attack um, versus if they're in the, you know, defensive formation here, they're not going to be able to attack from there, but they're much stronger on the defense. So it builds in an inherent defender advantage from set pe in set pieces because um, you're able to see it expressed in these areas. And once you get your head around the system and sort of like what it's communicating to you, it's using a whole different language than you're used to in other tactical war games. And once you kind of go through a couple turns and start to understand the subtleties of like where units are and when you're open to counterattack. So for example, here in the final stages of the game, we had the British um, here defending, we had two brigades um, standing kind of to the southwest of Blenheim. I don't necessarily think that means they're outside the town. I actually think it means they're inside the town because, you know, they still get the terrain bonus anytime they're attacked in here. But what it does mean is that they are sort of like arrayed in lines in a way that protects attacks from this direction and from this direction. Um, and so once you understand the visual language that the game is t talking to you with, um, you can kind of see how these mechanics reinforce the sort of like doctrine of the period. Um, flanking and, uh, sort of um, linear, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Linear stability, linear, uh, the constitution of your linear formations. All of that is expressed in the positioning inside the areas and adjacent forces around you. And all of that's built into the modifiers of the combat system. And once you understand the combat system, you can see where things work. So like, you know, I was trying to attack with the French across here. I did several attacks. It didn't work. And the British would just had like a really strong dug in position in this town. But like in other situations up here with the Bavarians and where the Prince Eugen got into trouble was that they were in the center trying to push the attack. And then suddenly the French, you know, when they were taking their strategic movement, they could move their units back and ready them right at the beginning of a turn on, by their leaders. And then suddenly when it comes to their orders phase, now these units who have, who have dressed ranks and, and reformed into an attack formation can then attack forward. Um, and conversely, I know I talked about this in one of my, in one of my clips earlier, which is like, if a, if a formation is like this inside of a hex, like without a leader, there's no easy way for them to get into attack formation. So even though you may have like one unit here like this, this may look really bad, but these units are arrayed defensively, and this unit is arrayed for attack. And so there's not as much there's not danger here from this flank if there's if there's no way to get these guys without spending many many orders to retrieve them because there's an order for each stack, right? So here's one order, here's two orders, and then maybe the turn's over. And so then the French, you know, they they move their guys back, and now they're in a less defensible position. And then it goes back to the English turn, and now suddenly they can attack, and they don't have to deal with the bonuses you get from being in these sort of um, like bordering hexes. So there's a lot of really interesting subtleties to the way that the tactics play out. I did get a real sense of the linear formations in this game, even though it's, it was unlike anything I had ever seen before. Um, what else do I like it? I really like the map and the counters. I think they're really beautiful. Um, I think that the game is immensely playable. Uh, I was getting through it real fast once I understood it. Uh, turns are not that long. You're ta basically taking two to three activations, sometimes more. Um, and But you're really limited. Even if you have that many orders, you know, you're really only making one to two attacks a turn, maybe three, but a lot of your other orders are going to be to like reorganize your troops. Reorganization in this system is super important. Like I said early in part one, you know, you want to pull your guys off the line if they're demoralized. Otherwise, you're going to end up with tons of casualties because these guys contribute nothing in battle, right? And because you're limited by your leaders in terms of rallying them, 
uh, you're, and you, you take your leader out of the line to rally broken troops, then suddenly your leader is not contributing attack power. Or if he's positioned in such a way, let's say these guys are back here and your leader moves here, you know, you're not doing any strategic movement this turn because there's no one adjacent to your leader. So leader positioning is super, super, super important and the key to being really efficient with your actions. And it really gives you the sense as the leader moves around to take care of all these fires. You know, it feels like whack-a-mole. Marlborough was running up and down the line on the, on the left and the center to try and get guys back into line, to try and put himself in places where attacks could break through. Um, you know, all of that stuff, it feels really evocative when you've, when you've got such a tight economy around the leader's abilities and how you deploy them. Um, because a lot of the time uh, you have to choose between making them in a position for attack and maneuver or putting them in a position to rally broken units. And it's really up to you to figure out what is the most important at the, at the time. Um, there wasn't a lot of, of movement along the line. I mean, most of the units are still kind of where they were. But again, we only fought for three hours. And again, you know, it was the plan was to attack the flanks. And that's kind of what we did. And we did see some action in the center and that we did get some movement, but we're not talking about sweeping grand maneuvers. This is not going to be um, like a, like an ancients game maybe, or where like the routes are going to call, you know, send units forward. You can get some of those things happening, but with 20 minute turns, you're not really going to see it um, instantaneously. It's going to be a very slow, uh, slow motion change of the battle lines. And uh, you can see, if you go back to part one, you can see where we ended. If you go back to part one, you can kind of see where some of that movement occurred and where some of the collapses happened. Um, so yeah, so I just think this is a, such a breath of fresh air. Um, I, I just am so impressed with uh, the way this plays and the history that it reflects and the way it feels as you're playing it. It's really hard to get across that, and I hope I did a good job, but um, you know, it, it just feels really cool. Um, the one other thing I would say is that it comes with a really nice setup card. Let's see if I can get this... So it tells you how to set up the battle on this card, which is really nice, um, and uh, it was really quick to do. Um, you just you know choose the units from each brigade and, and core that you want, put them in the appropriate areas. Tells you whether they can set up in center or or have to set up in the center or on the edges. Um, if there's areas where I think the game is a little rough around the edges, I, I think it's the, the designer and publisher did a great job in making something so uh, unique, very playable. Um, and, and very understandable once you, un, you know, get a couple of turns under your belt. I think the area that was most concerning to me are the player aids. They looked good at first. They looked like, wow, I could play the whole game off this. But really what you're looking at here are just charts. There are things that need to be on this player aid that are not. So, for example, the, uh, in the ranged fire table here, there's no reminder that there's a minus two if you're firing into woods or a town hex. That should have been on here. Um, morale. I think this is the biggest bugaboo for me. Morale. When you're checking morale for route at the end of a turn, I had to look in the rule book every single time for the procedure because the while it does have modifiers to your morale adjustment for the die roll, it doesn't describe to you how you calculate the morale value that you're modifying. And for some reason, I could not get it to stick in my head. It has to do with number of... Um, of uh, fresh brigades that are in your area, minus the number of enemy fresh brigades that are in areas adjacent, plus the number of uh, friendly uh, fresh brigades that are in adjacent areas. And it just, it was so, like, I just would not stick. And I really wish we had a table here that calcul that told you how to calculate it because it's not a hard calculation. It's just so unintuitive that uh, it needed a, a reminder somewhere. Um, I do like the strategic movement order rules. That's really nice. Again, on the combat tables, you have all the modifiers, but the one thing I would have liked to have seen here was the reminder about cavalry pursuit um, and the stacking limits when you got into a terrain that had more than uh, more than three difficult terrain hexes. That's not on here. That was hard to remember as well. Uh, even just the general stacking limits of six per, per area would have been nice as a reminder on here. So I think there's a lot of work that could go into... Well, not a lot. I think there's some areas where you could polish up some of the reminders and the rules that you need to play the game um, in the space that you have here. It doesn't need to just be the charts. There needed to be some additional reminders of some of those small rules. So read the rulebook carefully when you're reading it because there are some things about the game that are not on the player aid that are really easy to forget, especially as you're trying to come to terms with something you've probably never played before. The rules themselves are really nice. Um, they're really very clear. Uh, the text has been very... Um, efficiently written. The examples are really good. There's actually a lot of, at the back, really good examples of, uh, well, there's, there's the history and design notes, but there's some really good examples of movement and combat, a bunch of them all in a row, giving you different ways to look at what possible situations you may hit in the game. Um, really, if you're confused after reading it, which you probably will be, and even after playing a turn or two, it really helps to look at these. They did a great job um, showing you how to do it correctly. Um, what else? Um, I mean, I think oh the one other thing I would say is the combat system is a little deterministic and a little random. So um, it can be very swingy. 
Um, but doing all of the calculations uh, is somewhat tedious. Um, now, granted, I was doing it for both sides and I was playing solo, so you really only have to do it for your own uh, units when you're playing. But again, you're doing it both on defense and offense. So, you know, look at how many modifiers you've got. And then you've got to look at, okay, are my units in the center? Are they on the edges? That adds some, that adds some stuff. Then you have to count up all the adjacent areas that have enemy brigades compared to your own. So the counting up of the combat strength before you roll the dice is um, somewhat laborious. And if you don't like that, like if you just wanted a CRT with a table, uh, you know, where combat resolution is quick in a die roll, this is also probably not the game for you. That said, I do think all of these things give you tactical considerations that you have to take into account when you're playing. So even though it is laborious, it is important to remember, like, do I have units with battalion guns? You know, do I want to make an attack with two units without battalion guns? No, oftentimes, especially if you're trying to storm a town or cross a river, you need those bonuses, right? And so, you know, you're looking for these units that have the battalion gun symbol behind them. Or, you know, are you going to cavalry charge? Um, and are you gonna, are you risking a counter charge against you? And if you don't make this attack and become disrupted, do you open yourself up for counter attack? Um, if you make the attack and break through, are you then suddenly surrounded on multiple sides by enemies that gives the counter attackers a better chance to hit you back? So while it is laborious, there is a lot of really interesting, crunchy stuff in here that is uh, makes the tactical decision making really, really strong, more so than other games I've played recently, where it's just like move up and then you roll a bunch of dice for fire combat and maybe attack. Um, there is a real sense that like the positioning and um, decisions that you make with the formations and where you put them can have long lasting uh, consequences uh, as the game develops. Um, that I think is about everything I wanted to say about it, everything I was thinking about as I played it. Um, I think this is a fantastic system. I really, really liked it. I think uh, one more thing I would say is um, I don't know face-to-face -face how engaging necessarily this would be if you're the French player. You're primarily going to want to be in a defensive posture most of the game. You have all of the victory locations. You want to let Marlboro come to you. So there's, you know, there are opportunities for counterattack for sure. You're not just sitting back passively, but you're doing way less maneuver than the Anglo allied player is. And if you're looking for a more maneuver-heavy game, you may not have as much fun playing the French in a face-to-face -face game. It also seems very hard for Marlboro to win, but, uh, you know, this is based on my first play. I also think that once you've got the system down, is there enough depth here, once you understand it really properly, is there enough depth and opportunities for different strategies? That, I think, the... the verdict is still out on. I could definitely see after a couple plays this feeling a bit scripted uh, in terms of like the outcome because it is so static. Now that is part of the warfare of the time. It was fairly static, but um, you know, this may, this game may not have the staying power of um, something that has a lot more variability to it. Now that could also just be Blenheim itself as a battle. And I'm very keen to see if we get the Napoleonic and Great Northern War uh, entries into this system because I think that would be really fascinating and really a great contrast to see if it's Blenheim that lends to that feeling or if it's the system. But I think as a solo game, this is an excellent solo game, primarily because the order die roll system means it's always, um, you're always having to adapt on the fly. You never know when your strategy is going to be done. Um, and so it kind of fakes out the solo player in terms of like when it comes to your turn for one half of the game, you need to figure out what you're going to do based on the conditions that you've got in front of you. So yeah, definitely give Blenheim a look uh, from Legion War Games. They still have this in stock. I think this is super, super creative um, system. I hope we see more of it. And I had a really, really, really good time playing it. And I hope you enjoyed watching it um, because it was uh, a huge surprise to me. Um, and certainly I've noted it on my list of games for the end of 2024 that I think have uh, are going to be sort of my favorites or really stuck with me.